looking at the limits of detection or detection limits, one also needs to understand where to use what. This particular slide will give you an idea not only about the sensitivity of the different methods. Of course, we took a look at the fact that what are the factors that need to be taken into consideration, but even the sensitivity factor is of great importance for an analyst. Without ad adequate understanding of detection limit capabilities, lengthy preparation pr procedures may be required prior to analysis. Generally, the best detection limits are attained using ICP-MS and graphite furnace AAS. Now, you will see that GFAA and ICP-MS can go up to 0 0.01 and 0 0.001 respectively to the limits of detection. Whereas, for more you know less sensitive and more frequent analysis, flame AAS and ICP AES are good enough. And that is why there is uh, this available information what to use and when to use. Flame atomic absorption spectrometry, the absorption of electromagnetic radiation by atoms allows both qualitative and quantitative determination of a wide range of elements. So, not only qualitative whether it is present or absent, but also how much of it in concentration is present can be determined for a large variety of elements. Narrow band sources of radiation specific to a particular element irradiate the at atomic vapor produced by flame furnace or other methods and the absorption is measured. And the beauty of this spectroscopic method is that the absorption is directly proportional to the molecular species that is present. So, it cannot be only under very uh, severe chemical uh, uh, coagulation method or if there are chemical agglomerates, then this can vary. Otherwise, if it is a dilute solution, it will always give correct result because the absorption is directly proportional to the molecular species concentration. And that is why it is always recommended that very dilute solutions to, should be analyzed and the, then multiplied by the dilution factor. Atoms may be excited by incident UV or visible EMR and if the wavelength corresponds to that of the transition, it will be absorbed. Now, it is the incident radiation should be matching with the excitation wavelength that is required for that particular molecular species or atom or ion, otherwise it will not excite. Suppose if we are analyzing copper metal and particular wavelength which is very suited for copper is not shown, some other wavelength is shown, it will not give the analysis because it will not excite the copper ions to the vapors and finally, the vapors getting ex uh, and the atomized uh, atom then uh, uh, interacting with that radiation. The degree of absorption will depend on concentration. The sample is generally volatilized by flame or furnace and the source of lamp is hollow cathode lamp or electrodeless lamp. However, when such analysis is being done, it is not always foolproof. There are always interferences and what are these interferences and how to avoid these interferences is also a challenge for the analyst to face. The interferences in such analysis are spectral interferences, ionization interferences and physical interferences. As the name suggests, spectral interferences come into play when we are taking into account ICP. 
in multi element analysis where the spectral lines of excitations are very close, one has to, to choose the higher range of spectral lines if they are coming very close. Similarly, if the, there are not many ionized situation, the metal has not completely dissolved, it causes ionization interferences. And of course, there could be some foreign bodies which can cause physical interferences. So, the samples should be very dilute, should be clear and should be filtered carefully through filter paper because otherwise the nebulizer will get clogged and the aerosol will not form. Taking into more account and detailed account of ICP, the ICP is an argon plasma maintained by the interaction of the RF field and the ionization argon gas. Now, this refractive field is there outside the flame. The ICP can reach temperatures as around 10,000 Kelvin with sample temperatures between 5000 to 8000 Kelvin. So, you see that the flame has very, very high temperature and therefore, the ionization and the excitation takes place very readily. These temperatures allow complete atomization of elements, thus minimizing any chemical interferences effects. The advantages of using ICP, there are several, several advantages. Over 70 elements, metal and not metals can be determined using ICP, multi element analysis from one solution. You see, I told you in case of AAS, one has to go one by one. Suppose if I want to analyze 9 heavy metals, I will have to do the experiment 9 times by changing the lamp every time and for every analysis there will be 3 nebula, I mean 3 times the experiment will be carried. First the standard, then the blank and then the sample. So, 27 experiments need to be carried out. Whereas, if we are using ICP, just by one nebulization, the all the 9 elements can be programmed and analyzed simultaneously. Provides wide linear range of detection. That means, from a very low level to a fairly high level, it has a wide range of linearity. That means, when the calibration graph is made, the calibration graph shows a very linear response. And lead, for example, can show a linearity or a, you know range of detection from 0 0.01 to 10 ppm. It is very rapid analysis. Although it is costly due to high cost of argon gas, but when it comes to sensitivity to be able to analyze trace quantities versus to be able to analyze in a more accurate manner, then it is definitely ICP has an edge over AAS. ICP and its types, discharge of high voltage from a Tesla coil through flowing argon provides electrons which ignite the gas to a plasma. This conducting plasma is enclosed in a high frequency electromagnetic field. It will cause the ions and the electrons to collide. The temperature rises to 10,000 Kelvin. At this temperature, energy transfer is efficient. It is held in its place by the magnetic field as a fireball. The sample aerosol enters the, this fireball and thus pushed as they cool. They emit their characteristic lines that is what is shown in ICP AES and in ICP OES. Both are emission spectroscopic methods. Coming to ICP AES, the ICP AES is an emission spectroscopic photometric technique exploiting the fact that excited electrons emit energy at a given wavelength as they return to the ground state. 
it is of common understanding that suppose if an atom is getting ex excited by absorbing light, it will go and reside on a higher excited excitation state, but it cannot remain there for too long. So, it will then come back to its ground state by emitting this light and it is this emitted light which is actually the amount that it has absorbed and the amount would depend on the molecular species that is present. So, everything is related to each other. The fundamental characteristic of this process is that each element emits energy at specific wavelength particularly to its uh, chemical characters. That means, it is very, very peculiar and particular to its chemical character only. Although each element emits energy at multiple wavelengths in the ICP AES technique, it is most common to select a single wavelength or a very few for a given element. So, as I said, there are variable, variable and multiple wavelengths available for every element. Now, if we are making a program of analyzing say copper, cadmium, arsenic, mercury at the same time and if by chance the copper and the cadmium have very close wavelengths, then for one of them we will use the first wavelength and in the case of cadmium, we will use a higher wavelength so that it can be identified correctly. Otherwise, if we choose the same wavelength or the closer wavelength, we would not know whether it is referring to cadmium's concentration or copper's concentration. So, that is a little tricky job. Otherwise, analyzing on ICP is not much of a challenge. The intensity of energy emitted at a chosen wavelength is proportional to the amount that is the concentration of that element in the analyzed sample. So, the crux of the analysis of this particular spectroscopic method is and even other spectroscopic method where we do quantitative analysis is that whatever is the intensity of the energy that is emitted of a chosen wavelength is directly proportional to the amount or the concentration of the analyte of that element in that sample. Thus, by determining which wavelengths are emitted by a sample and by determining their intensities, the analyst can quantify the elemental composition of a given sample relative to the reference standard. So, we have a standard say of 4 ppm. Now, in the sample when we analyze, we find out whether it is more than 4 ppm or less than 4 ppm or close to 4 ppm because of this, uh, you know, determination of their intensities, it is possible to find out the concentration of the analyte very easily. Inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrometry, that is ICP AES. Since the establishment of the ICP AES laboratory in 1981, it is quite recent that means a number of analytical methods on ICP AES have been developed. The characteristics of ICP AES are low detection limit, high accuracy and precision, relative freedom from matrix interferences and high sample throughput. You see it has four very advantageous qualities. That means, uh, it can go up to low levels of detection. Even if it is in trace quantities, ICP AES is the answer. Then it has very high accuracy and precision. The results will always be correct and there is a rep rep uh, 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 repeatability of the result and precision. Relative freedom from the matrix interferences. That means, the matrix does not interfere in the analytical method and there large number of high number of samples can be analyzed. That is why it has high sample throughput. Simultaneous determination of 15 trace earth elements 
in rocks could be carried out. Now, 15 elements, rare trace elements could be analyzed. Determination of major, minor and trace elements in geochemical exploration samples could also be carried out. These are a few examples to show you the versatility of the method ICP AES. How many types of different situations, different samples, yet ICP AES is the answer. Simultaneous determination of germanium, tin, arsenic, antimony and bismuth by hydride generation of ICP AES. Trace element analysis in pyrite, sulphide, arsenopyrite, molybdenite and cassiterite monominerals. Separation, pre-concentration and determination of trace elements in natural waters. Now, you see so many varieties have been carried out by using ICP AES. I had mentioned something about hydride generation, whether it is atomic absorption or it is ICP, the molecular species of such transition metals like germanium, antimony, tin, arsenic and bismuth need to be converted to one oxidation state. Normally, they would exist in either 2 and 4 oxidation state or 3 and 5 oxidation state in the solution. Now, to be able to analyze whether it is in a 3 oxidation state or 5 oxidation state or whether it is the metal is in 2 oxidation state or 4 oxidation state they must be brought down to one particular oxidation state and that is what is done. The higher oxidation state is reduced to the lower. So, then there is only one type of molecular species per element and that is done by the method of hydride generation method. It is applicable to atomic absorption as well as to ICP both. Components of ICP and AES. All ICP AES system consists of several components. We shall focus this discussion on three main aspects, the sample introduction system, the torch assembly and the spectrometer. So, if we look at any ICP machine, how does it differ from one machine to any another machine are only on three aspects. The sample introduction technique may be different or the plasma torch assembly may be slightly different or the spectrometer analytical part or the detector part can be different. The sample introduction system on ICP AES consists of a peristaltic pump, Teflon tubing, a nebulizer and a spray chamber. The fluid sample is pumped into the nebulizer via the peristaltic pump. So, there is a very specialized method of sample introduction up to the nebulizer. There is a peristaltic pump which pushes and then it comes to the nebulizer where the aerosol is formed. This was not the situation when we looked at AAS. So, the sample introduction system is slightly modified and is more advanced and it uses Teflon tubing. Why? Because Teflon is most unreactive to most of the acidified solutions. The nebulizer then generates an aerosol or mist and injects humidified argon gas into the chamber along with the sample. The nebulizer accumulates mist in the spray chamber, where the largest mist particles settle out as waste and the finest particles are subsequently swept into the torch assembly. So, the role of nebulizer is to first form the aerosol mist and that with the humidified argon gas are put into the chamber of with the sample. Then the nebulizer actually accumulates in that spray chamber and then the larger particles are you know going to the wall of the, uh, the spray chamber 
but the finer particles actually get swept into the torch assembly. Approximately 1 percent of the total solution eventually enters the torch as mist, whereas the remainder is pumped away as waste. So, you see that how sensitive it is that even with 1 percent of the solution entering the torch, it is able to analyze as many as the analy anal analyte has, as many elements as the analyte has in its composition. ICP OES. ICP OES is optical emission spectroscopy, which makes use of the fact that the atoms of elements can take up energy from an inductively coupled plasma are thereby excited and fall back into their ground state again emitting a characteristic radiation. So, here it is the optically sensitive emission which is trapped and which is then correlated with the amount of analyte that has been present which has caused this and it is done with the help of inductively coupled plasma. So, thereby it excites and then falls back to the ground state and it emits a characteristic radiation. So, it is as simple as that although the names are slightly different, but their functioning remains the same. The identification of this radiation permits the qualitative analysis of a sample. The quantitative determination takes place on the basis of proportionality of radiation intensity and element concentration in calibration and analysis sample. So, one can do qualitative analysis as well as quantitative analysis and for doing quantitative analysis calibration curve must be required because you need to have reference standard against which the sample will be analyzed whether this much concentration is present or this much concentration is present. If there is no reference, if there is no scale, a, an absolute value cannot be given to the sample. In ICP OES analysis, the liquid sample is introduced into the inductively generated argon plasma through a nebulizer system and excited. So, here also there is a use of nebulizer and there is this argon that produces the plasma flame and so all other things remain the same. The spectrum emitted is transferred into a spectrometer where it is decomposed into individual wavelengths and evaluated. The intensities of the spectral lines are measured by CID that is the semiconductor detectors. The calibration is effected with multi element solutions mixed with standard solutions. So, you see that multi element analysis can be carried out, but you need to have multi element standards for that. Multi all the standards are mixed and a multi element standard is prepared and then with the help of semiconductor detectors, it can be these spectral lines can be detected very efficiently. The features of ICP OES, the method is suited for multi element determination in solution or after appropriate sample preparation of solid samples brought into solution. So, it is both applicable to solid samples as well as appropriately you know dissolved samples can be prepared and multi element determination can be carried out using ICP optical emission spectroscopy that is ICP OES. Detectable elements approximately 70, determinable concentration range from a few microgram per liter to 2 percent in solution or 1 microgram per gram up to 100 percent in solids can be carried out very effectively. The precision 1 to 3 percent for major element plus minus 10 to 30 percent for trace elements is the precision rate particularly suited for stoichiometric determination, material controls, material determinations. Test quantities at least range of 0, 1 to 0 milligram for major elements 
and 100 to 500 milligram for trace. So, these are the test sample range that even if you have very small quantities, major elements can be identified. If there are 100 to 500 milligram samples, even trace quantities can be identified. Measurement times of generally a few minutes per sample. For solid samples, a possibly time consuming sample preparation must be taken into account. Although in some cases, the sample preparation time is a little longer, but that does not deter because the accuracy, the precision, the kind of range of 70 possibility of doing 70 element analysis in one go is the attraction for using ICP. Coming to yet another very important topic is the trace and ultra trace analysis in liquids by atomic spectrometry. So far we have seen the advantages of using AAS or ICP and at what point, point of time the analyst must make this choice is a very crucial decision. Atomic spectroscopy, whether it is inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry that is ICP MS or ICP atomic emission spectroscopy that is ICP AES are widely used as routine techniques in analytical laboratories for multi-elemental determination at trace and ultra trace levels in liquid samples of quite different matrix composition. Limits of detection that is the LODs varied between nanogram per milliliter range in ICP AES down to pentogram per ml range in ICP MS for trace element analysis in aqueous solution. Using special separation and enrichment techniques for analytes, the limit of detection can also be further improved. That is, in techniques for analytes, which like ICP MS, it can go down to even sub femtogram per ml range, which is relevant for special applications in microelectronics and determination of long-lived radionuclides in body fluids or in environmental samples. So, you see as and when the importance and the relevance of analyzing trace and ultra trace, you see sub pentogram in 1 ml is a very, very small quantity of analyte. And when there was a necessity to analyze even at that range, there is an answer by ICP MS or ICP AES method which can do so. In addition, ICP MS possesses the unique capabil capability of measuring precise accurate isotope ratios which is applied in the precise determination of element concentrations by isotope dilution technique. The capabilities, advantages and limit of ICP MS and ICP AES are examined as most important multi elemental atomic spectrometric techniques in comparison with atomic absorption spectrometry for the analysis of trace impurities in liquid samples. You see that is the reason why I went on to explain to you that what to use where, because ideally a flame absorption spectrometer is well suited for routine analysis at ppm level, but when pentogram or nanograms have to be analyzed in a liquid sample, there has to be certain modification in the machine and the analytical method. Otherwise, they cannot be analyzed quantitatively, although they may be analyzed qualitatively. Presence or absence is not a big deal to find out, but to find out exact concentration of its presence in a sample is a big challenge for the analyst. Atomic spectrometry has become established with its ability to provide very sensitive, accurate, precise determination of trace and ultra trace elements 
and species in liquid samples such as high purity solutions, environmental materials, different types of water that is rain water, tap water, river water, sea water and waste water, biological and medical fluids like blood, serum or urine or nuclear and radioactive waste solutions. So you see there is a huge variety where these ICPs can be used very effectively, very accurately, very sensitively and precise determination can be brought about. The most common aggregate state of sample investigated in atomic spectrometry in liquid state. Besides the direct analysis of liquids, with respect to impurities, aqueous solutions resulting from digestion of solid samples that is geological samples, biological samples, medical samples, metal alloys and ceramics and also organic solvents have often been investigated. A range of spectrometric techniques is available providing excellent tool in the trace and ultra trace analysis of the liquids. So it has covered the entire range of very sensitive areas like the medical, the geological, the biological, metal alloys, ceramics and all can be analyzed by these ICPs very effectively. AAS of course we have seen that the flame AAS is not very sensitive method. However, it is sensitive enough to analyze that is suited for the determination of selected elements at trace and partly also at the ultra trace concentration if we are using graphite furnace. So even in the class of AAS the GFAAS that is the graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy is the answer. But flame atomic absorption that is the FAAS is not really suited for trace and ultra trace. After enrichment of the analyte by ion exchanger that is the solid phase extraction although the flame AAS also can be upgraded or the sample is enriched, so it can come within the limits of detection of the FAA. Limits of detection in the low and sub microgram per liter are possible as described in the determination of copper, zinc and iron in tap water by Kang and at all, he have shown that this is possible, whereas graphite AAS is by comparison with a FAAS more sensitive and possesses lower limit of detection which can be further improved by combination with enrichment procedures. So there is a possibility to be able to use flame AAS if the sample has gone through an enrichment procedure and what is that enrichment procedure? The enrichment procedure requires an ion exchange solid phase extraction to be added on to the analytical method. Principles of analytical technique. In ICP MS and ICP AES, the liquid solution is nebulized using an effective pneumatic nebulizer whereby the fine aerosol forms is transported with argon into the ICP torch. So instead of a peristaltic pump and an ordinary nebulizer, here there is a pneumatic nebulizer. The rest remains the same, the formation of the aerosol and getting transported to the argon torch and all that remains the same. The ICP at the plasma temperature is at 5000 to 8000 Kelvin. The chemical compounds and the water matrix are all evaporated at this temperature and then the molecules are dissociated into their atomic constituents and the neutrals are excited and ionized. The main common parts of ICP MS and ICP AES are the solution introduction systems and the ICP source and the spectrometer and that we will see in a little while in this slide. 
different types of models and different types of its you know adaptation are required and therefore, the machine can then be used. You see this is an ICP MS machine, this is a simple ICP. When you have an, a micro concentrating nebulizer, how it looks like, if it has ultrasonic nebulizer, how the machine looks like and so on and so forth. Advantages, an interesting advantage of ICP MS and ICP AES as multi element trace analytical method with a wide dynamic range compared to other MS techniques with multi element capabilities used for the trace analysis of solid samples such as glow discharge MS that is GDMS or spark source MS, SSMS is that the inductively coupled ion and or excitation source works at atmospheric pressure. So, these work at a very ambient atmospheric pressure. This feature of ICP technique reduces the time of trace analysis and opened up the possibility of combined techniques for liquids that is HPLC, capillary electrophoresis and hydride generation. Gases that is gas chromatography can be coupled to ICP MS and also fast trace analysis of solid samples. The main advantage of using combined techniques for speciation analysis is that the argon gas flow rate required for the chromatographic system that is HPLC or capillary electrophoresis and also the ICP can be adjusted accordingly using a suitable nebulization system. Furthermore, time resolved transient signals of analytes can be measured within a short time. Now, it is also possible that there is a uh, you know a hyphenated machine where the HPLC or capillary electrophoresis or hydride generation can be coupled with the ICP MS or ICP AES. That adds on to further more advantage it can also be coupled with GC and so the gas if the samples are gaseous then the gaseous samples can be uh, handled very easily. Therefore, it is one of the best methods of analysis of both solids and liquids and as well as gaseous samples.